Okay, let's do it. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, they're all populating the screen, which is great. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm just Hello. gonna make sure. <laughs> Make sure that everybody is is on board. That's great. Um, I think you all got the memo, or most of you did, <laughs> that you you muted yourselves. Anyway, let me just start by saying welcome to the bonus Finborough Forum for the month of uh, November. Um, this is our second one this month. We had um, a forum meeting earlier in the month with Liz Stevenson. Um, we've managed to get two into one month, which is, you know, helping to make everybody feel much better during lockdown. Um, and today we are absolutely delighted to have with us Anders Lusgarten, who I think is actually zooming in from Denmark. Are you in Denmark uh, still, correct. Anders? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching across the waves to you from Copenhagen, where uh, people are largely not dead, which is always a plus. And um, that's great. <laughs> society is basically functional and doesn't contain sociopathic people who believe masks and 5G are out to kill you when it's quite obvious that, in fact, your government is out to kill you. So no conspiracies needed there. Well, it's wonderful to start out on that really positive note. Thanks, Anders. Um, if I could just start with a little bit of um, housekeeping, could I ask people um, just to make sure that they are muted because we can get kind of some background distraction. And also, if you wouldn't mind turning off your cameras um, until, um, well, until you're invited to ask questions. That's not because it is really lovely to see everybody, but it, it just helps save on the bandwidth. And it also can be a little bit distracting, um, you know, when we're doing the interview. So if you don't mind, um, thank you very much. Um, okay, I think everybody is pretty much in right now, so I'll, I'll just jump right in. Right. Um, Anders is um, known as a political playwright. I think that when, um, whenever that's asked, you know, who are the big political playwrights of the moment, the first name that comes up is Anders Lusgarten, and after that perhaps James Graham, but certainly Anders when it comes to big international questions, it's Andrew is the, is the first name. He is also the, um, the inaugural winner of the Harold Pinter Prize, I believe. And um, he has, he's written plays that have grappled with what was going on in Zimbabwe under Mugabe, um, the Chinese revolution, um, Israel, Palestine, the BNP, um, Andrews gets around and grapples with a lot of stuff and I, I just love that about his work and I, I also want to say because I think um, it's important uh, that, that we say how, at the Finborough how much we value Anders, we were part of his um, early story Very and <laughs> we, we'd like you to talk a little bit about that in a minute <laughs> <laughs> and, and also I think from our end we you know, um, with our reading team, our literary team, Anders is one of three plays we insist that all our readers read um, his uh, sort of first big play, the, A Day at the Racists, you know, uh, because we always hold that it's a play with incredible heart. And, um, you know, so he means a lot to us over here at the Finborough. Um, but if I could maybe start off by asking Anders, I mean, I see you as a sort of a, an activist. Mm -hmm. And I know that you also, um, you taught drama in prisons, which actually is very close to my heart because I taught creative writing in prisons for four years. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to, to know, did you, did you start out as an activist who in drama or mm -hmm. a dramatist who began to get more political? Can you talk about oh, that? Oh, very much the first one, man. Um, I didn't really ever plan to be a writer at all. Um, I, it never really occurred to me. For a start, I'd not really, uh, never having heard of the film or having really been to any plays at all until I was it really, yeah, at least mid-20s, man, maybe later. Theatre didn't occur to me at all. Um, I'd sort of vaguely thought one day I might write a novel, but they contain a lot of words. It, just, it turns out novels on closer inspection. That's a that's a that's a, an inside piece of information for for all you you listeners out there. Um, novels are long and require a lot of writing. And I was like, ah, I, don't, I don't actually know if I 
I wanted to spend the whole time developing, writing a novel and then finding that obviously it wasn't very good and you'd have to learn it again. Um, and I thought about writing films, but actually even at the time, I remember seeing what a gigantic piece of human sewage Harvey Weinstein was and thinking, holy shit, if that's the kind of people you have to deal with in film, I'm not having any of that. So basically I was a, um, uh, I was a professional athlete. I was a 400 meter uh, runner professionally. And I was also, I did a PhD in California, kind of uh, in order to run around in the sunshine and eat burritos, really. Um, and partly because I did, uh, so I did Chinese as my undergrad degree. And that was quite interesting because it was a way of understanding societies that are not your own, but it involved a lot of learning very, very tedious sounds, which it turned out two weeks into my four week, four week, four year course, that I was quite tone deaf and incapable of distinguishing between some of the important components of the Chinese language. So I decided to do this or apply for this PhD scholarship in America um, to do kind of, really look deeper at um, communism and capitalism, really, and look at the evolution of uh, capitalism in, in other societies apart from the West. Uh, and inexplicably, they took me on and I went and I was running and eating burritos and reading these funny books. And I found also that academia was a little bit abstract for me and a little bit kind of um, self-referential. I took a lot of courses with Wendy Brown and highly intelligent people who are, you know, very, very interesting, but I couldn't really, it just wasn't for me that kind of the postmodern self-referential discourse. So I, an email came around when I was at Berkeley as well in California saying, we want volunteers to teach on death row uh, in San Quentin, just up the, up the road. And I was like, I better get to this meeting early because it's going to be very, very popular. And I turned up and there was nobody there. <laughs> and they just said, right, well, you better start then. And I was 23 at the time. And they sent me off to the death row meeting the following day. Um, and put me in a room with 40 murderers. And that's, that was one of those moments where I was a bit like, wow, man, this is one of those kind of like tests of character where either you cry and reach for the panic button or you stick it out. Um, and so I told some jokes and taught them art appreciation, um, which was very, very good fun. And I really enjoyed doing that. And when I finished the PhD or finished being in academia as long as I could stand it. I came back to Britain and worked in uh, British prisons for three years, um, all the South London Knicks primarily. And while I was there, they said in Wandsworth, can you start teaching a drama course? Because it will get the lads out of the prison. And I was like, um, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm probably less qualified than they are, but we'll give it a go. And so we read some plays and we couldn't really make a head nor tail out of many of these classic plays, which none of us could really understand the frames of reference of. But I found a play called Accidental Death of an Anarchist, which is uh, about the police killing a prisoner. And I said, all right, I'll do an adaptation of this to be about the Stephen Lawrence case. And we did it with the fellas inside and um, their families came. And it was quite overwhelming, actually, to see the capacity people had to not just engage through storytelling but to completely transport everybody in that room to somewhere else and I was like okay this is interesting because at the time I was also an activist as you mentioned uh, I spent seven or eight years working in um, well I spent about 20 years working uh, or volunteering in different um, anti-corporate and anti-capitalist organizations and I was working on um, particularly uh, development banks and development banks being some of the most malicious and destructive forms of sort of the use of public capital for private ends, which we now see every day in the procurement of PPE. Um, and I was sort of getting tired of writing all these reports for NGO people that only other NGO people read, or again, discourses and narratives, stuff that was only comprehensible to, uh, to people in government or you know people within that frame of reference. And I thought you could start telling stories through story <laughs> and political stories through something as immediate and immersive and in your face as a piece of theater. Then I went to the British theater. So that was a source of significant disappointment to turn up at a David Hare play and just be going, what is this? This is not what I thought I could do with this medium uh, in, in Wandsworth Prison. But yeah, so it was a complete accident. And then sort of in the course of things, I encountered this man here I see lingering. I don't see him anymore because he's disappeared. Mr. Neil McPherson, um, and he was quite uh, influential or sort of essential, really. Hello, there's the man himself. Um, yeah, he was absolutely essential in becoming a playwright because 
some of these things I was trying out and playing around with, he would read and we did a couple of uh, readings of a, a prison play I wrote, which actually I thought was quite good, but we somehow that didn't quite go anywhere um, with Kate Wasserberg, who's now running out of joint. And um, then a play about, uh, really about the polarization of American politics, actually, after 9-11, which was quite prescient. Um, uh, and then we did the, the first, my first real sort of full production was, was A Day at the Races, which is a very prescient play. Um, not so much in terms of uh, what happened to the, the vehicle, which is the BMP, but in terms of the disaffection of um, former Labour voters, working class people with new Labour and with neoliberal Labour, um, and the degree to which the right would start to, to adopt the language of class dispossession and populism. I could see that 10 years ago. Um, and that was, that was a very formative experience. And just, yeah, doing that play and seeing how it affected people and seeing that you could make people think about things. Um, yeah, that, so the Finber has been absolutely, there are, I definitely wouldn't be a writer without the Finber, man. There's no doubt about it. Okay, that, that's great to hear. And uh, you were writer in residence here for a while. Mm -hmm. or yeah, how many years was it? Uh, a couple of years at least. And yeah, we did, um, uh, so we did a day at the races and then we came back and did, uh, yeah, my play about Zimbabwe. Uh, oh, yes. The play called Black Jesus, which is about a sort of, um, a sort of a, a truth and reconciliation commission in Zimbabwe after Mugabe died. This was in 2013. So while he was still there, and really just look, really kind of looking at, um, how easy it is for the powerful to demonize the people they get to clear up their shit. So frequently in my plays, a very re frequently recurring character in my plays is essentially somebody whose job it is to clean up the shit of the rich, who is themselves probably not that progressive, if you want to call it that. Somebody who is has committed acts of violence or is quite right wing. There's a so the central character in that in uh, Black Jesus, Gabriel is a basically a Mugabe enforcer who's taken the fall for a lot of the, um, uh, the things that, that Mugabe did, but also that uh, colonialism wrought on Zimbabwean society and required uh, ZANU-PF to initially do very interesting things in, in fixing. And then, so my PhD is actually in Maoist politics. It's actually in um, the full arc of the Maoist revolution. And the Maoist revolution is very interesting because it's, a, it's one of the few genuinely grassroots mass revolutions that started bottom up and was then essentially hijacked by the Maoist bureaucracy. And the problem with Maoism is Mao very much. And when it became institutionalized and centralized, it became catastrophic, but there was something very powerful and moving in the early years of Maoism. And that's something you could say about Zanu PF as well. Um, I'm always interested in people who are a capable of of changing the world, but also the people. So this uh, another player wrote called Lampedusa, which has this this sort of twin tropes of people whose job it is to do the dirty work of the powerful. One of the things that's most difficult if you want to write political plays is how do you transfer these colossal structural issues into recognizable human uh, dynamics and relationships? Because obviously, one. Of the, so I think almost all political writing in this country is bad. And I think it's bad for a reason, which is that our politics refuses to understand structural causes, absolutely refuses to understand structural causes. Um, and that's what you see happening in the Labour Party right now. You see that um, the attempt is always to reduce it down or winnow it down to what individual people do to one another. But as we see with anything, whether it's racism or whether it's neoliberal capitalism, the evil lies in the structure. It's enacted in the people, but it, in, it begins in the structure. And if you can't engage with those structures and can't find ways to represent them on stage in ways that are human and real, you don't have a political play. And therefore, almost all political plays in this country do not have the macro dimension that they so badly require. And one of the ways to do that and not preach at people, not be, uh, not just have people that think what you think, because that's kind of boring. It's kind of boring to write as well as to watch. Is, you, is to find people that you don't agree with. And a lot of the time, the people that you don't agree with are, they're not the Philip Greens or the whoever, you know, the Abst or the Dido Hardings. Those people, are, those people barely exist. They're sort of two-dimensional cartoon fuckwits who are infinitely replaceable 
by other pompous products of the British class system. The people who are interesting are the people that have to enforce the regulations. You know, Pretty Patel is just a piece of shit and could be replaced by 20 other pieces of shit. But what is interesting are the people that then have to do the things that she lays down and how that makes them feel and act. Okay, that's really interesting. And also your mm, consideration of the audience and how the audience might react and perceive and, and take on board what you're saying. And what I'm quite interested in a lot of your plays is that you're not really interested in pandering to the, the liberal middle classes in, in a way you will turn a mirror on them and mm. uh, make them feel uncomfortable. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, if yeah. I, I think you had a, a quote there. 80% um, of British theatre is um, bourgeois wank, I think. So, yeah. yeah. In some ways, I, uh, that quote, man, follows me around. And kind of, <laughs> um, also, if anything, I wildly underestimated the percentage of bourgeois wank within British theatre, <laughs> particularly in the last five years. Fucking hell, man. It's gone to absolute shit. But anyway, um, so yes, what you're talking about there is something that I think, again, has not been apparent to many people really until the rise of Corbynism, which is that liberalism and the left are not the same. They are fundamentally antithetical. They are, liberals have more in common with the right than they do with the left by a huge distance. Even look at the origins of the word neoliberalism. It's a, you know, it's a variant on liberalism. The essence of liberal thinking is how to least restrain and most empower the individual. And there are a lot of powerful and, and useful and legitimate things in that mode of thinking. It's not to say that liberalism is evil. Um, there are a lot of enormously important components to the, in Western thought there. But what that means is liberalism is really finds it difficult for it not all to be about you. Finds it difficult to be part of mass movements. Finds it difficult to accommodate to the idea that the rational individual, which is the absolute essence of free market thinking isn't the most important thing within society and it isn't um and we see that now and so something that is um it's nice what you said to me about uh me being the first person you think of. i'm not sure that i'm the first person people in sort of positions of power think of and that's because i do what you're you're saying as a political writer is i try and take people on there is no point in writing flattery work there's no point in making the audience feel clever or reiterating what they already think or the Guardian has told them to think because um, while you want somebody to come away entertained and moved from a, a night out, you also, it's important that I use whatever very limited platform I have to correct the fact that there is almost no platform for the legitimate left in British politics. And there's certainly, I mean, you see what's happening right now in the Labour Party. There's a purge going on. I'm not a member of the Labour Party and I don't believe in parliamentary politics as the main way to change and improve the world. I think that's been a huge distraction for the left actually and a big bauble over the last few years. But yeah, in terms of what we need to say within our society, those things are simply not being said anywhere. And dissent is being criminalized at an extraordinarily fast rate. Not just in this country, you see what Macron is doing with Muslims, which is fascism, absolute outright fascism. You're talking about literally telling people that they have to get to the imams to confess that Islam is a, is a terrible religion and assign numbers to their children. It's, it's, it's quite extraordinary, the degree to which, to go back to the structural idea, we have a society in which the basic structures of the last 40 years are absolutely on fire in many important respects, literally. The most important of them is obviously the climate, is the fact that we are living in a society that is changing by the day in terms of the sustainability of life on earth. And that is directly the cause of industrial capitalism. And if you, you cannot have a society in which, so I did, to take it back to plays, I did a play, a radio play a few years ago called The Hamster. Now the hamster, as a little beast, doubles its weight when it's born every day. And then about the end of a, about a week into being a hamster, it stops doubling its weight because otherwise it would not be able to accommodate to its environment. But our growth paradigm is premised on the idea of infinite growth. So in my little play, uh, 
a couple gets a hamster and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And soon it becomes an attraction to hamsterologists. I'm not even sure there are hamsterologists, but we hypothesize that one. Um, and then it becomes like a massive tourist attraction and the council starts paying off all its bills and whatever. And of course it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And only the owner at the end is like, this needs to stop, this can't go on. And then it eats the neighbors and the council hushes it all up because obviously they don't want to kill the golden hamster. And um, you just, it sort of was making you think about uh, the insanity of infinite growth on a very, very finite planet. So that's one thing we obviously aren't talking about. The other thing, we're, another thing we're obviously not talking about is eight men, all white men own more wealth on this planet than half the population. So it's fair to say the whole trickle down theory hasn't worked out too well. And there are currently essentially no redistributive mechanisms in political thought. If you look at what you know the conservatives are doing, it's very, very, very much like the end of the Maoist era. It's quite interesting, it's very instructive studying Maoism. When they got to the end of Maoism and people were starving in their millions and the word got back to Mao, what Mao said was that it's because they haven't gone far enough. It's because they haven't implemented Maoism to my ideal pure specification and they need to go further. And that is precisely what neoliberal capitalism does now. Anytime you show the insane inequality or the pollution or the social damage or the mental health impact of this colossal display of, of inequality and, and, and punitive society, they go, it's because it hasn't gone far enough. The minute you go further, it'll get there. And that's sort of something that in, a quite a weak and obvious way the Corbyn regime was trying to argue against and we had the most extraordinary display of vitriol and hatred and rage that I've ever seen in politics and that's not to say that they got everything right I don't really have a lot of time for a lot of the ways that um, a lot of some of the politics was handled but just the the, the sheer the mere existence of people particularly young people asking for a better world is, is something that politics and liberalism simply cannot accept. And so what is the point in doing a play that fits in to those modes of thinking? The, you know, there, there are, I don't really think there's anybody who writes plays like I do. And that's not to big myself up. It's kind of, it's a shame. It's kind of like, I wish there were more playwrights who, you know, so some of the, I don't even want to mention names because some of them are cool people, but they, the way that they are only willing to ask the questions that the establishment wants them to ask is, it's kind of a dereliction of duty to me. The first job of a political writer is to ask the questions nobody really wants to ask. And to certainly to find ways to discomfort the powerful, but also to, to show the things that are just not being shown. And I do feel like with some of my work, I've managed to do that. Um, I had a play at the Royal Court, uh, which was uh, called If You Don't Let Us Dream, We Won't Let You Sleep, which was about austerity being a coup in 2013, which was quite a long time before people, it's just amazing how political discourse works because at that point, austerity was described by absolutely everybody apart from the people on the sharp end of it as a necessary requirement of political rah, 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 rah. turns out to have killed 160,000 people and been economically completely illiterate. Sunak is about to do it again, just because it went so well the first time. But that was the sort of thing that nobody wanted to say. And it, it was quite interesting. So the uh, reactions I got to that play, the reviews I got to that from that play were pretty hostile. And almost none of them were hostile about the play. They were hostile about the message. And that was a bit of an eye opener because that was my first play at a bigger theater. And I was like, well, they may or may not like what it has to say, but they'll kind of engage with it on its own terms, right? And then they were just like, I got a brilliant review from the Daily Telegraph moment which said, this man does not exist. There is no way this man exists. He is a Marxist collective. And I'm like, if only I was a Marxist collective. Sadly, it's just me out here on my own trying to tell the truth. But yeah, that sort of stuff, you know, you, go, you get a platform like that, the smart thing to do is to kiss some ass, be smart, but not too smart, not be too confrontational. And you get another platform like that. And I did not do that because I thought that was an opportunity to tell the truth about what was being done to our society. And as a result, I didn't get some of the platforms that people who have Royal Court downstairs plays tend to get. Um, there's nothing you can do about that, man. You don't, I'm not in this shit to, to have a career. It's quite a surprise to me I have a career, really. 
Um, I'm in it to, to try and influence, uh, to try and tell people what's really going on as best I can. And that obviously has limitations. There's only a certain number of people and often a certain type of people that come to the theater, but you just have to tell the truth, man, and not really worry about the consequences. Yeah, I think that's um, for a lot of people, you, um, you're you sort of uh, a trailblazer and, and you seem quite brave because you're not afraid to do that. And I think one other way that um, your work is different to the majority of the plays that are being written in this country. It's because it looks beyond Britain a lot. Mm. And Britain is, it's you know, a very insular place. And um, <laughs> it, that, is, that is mad to me. Like, so I've, I've, you know, I've interrupted your question, but- for No, a, well, basically my question was, could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, for a country that, you know, the sun never set on the British empire, they don't seem very interested in other countries, do they, the British? Like, it's amazing how, uh, you sort of talk to people. So I'm living in Denmark at the moment. I lived in France for a couple of years. One of the brilliant things about being a writer is if you don't, um, you know, if you can live in fairly whatever reduced circumstances, you can you can kind of wander around the world and do stuff um, and make your money stretch out as long as it will last. And which in Denmark isn't that long, incidentally. Thank you, little. Otherwise, I'd be starving to death and eating pigeons. But um, yeah, it's just. The, the inward looking nature of British society is that, that people don't know the basics of a lot of other, they don't know the basics of Ireland at all, do they? I mean, you know, the sort of the basic history and the in particularly the impact of Britain. So I'm writing a film. Um, I don't know if the film will get made, it probably won't get made, but it's a, my first effort at a film and it is about, um, it's a horror story about being haunted by the empire. I'm, I'm quite pleased with this. I think it's interesting. I think you can t you can trace absolutely everything in contemporary Britain, particularly Brexit, back to the ghosts of empire, to this sort of sense of um, Neil McPherson. I want it. It's a film, mate. I, I mean, it's a film. It, <laughs> have it, it's a film. Um, I'll have to rewrite it. But yeah, it's uh, so basically this the whole history of the British Empire. Not only what happened is it's just all completely hidden from us. But particularly the way it was given up, if you like, is quite different to the ends of other empires. So obviously- I must say that really shocked me when I came here. It's what the, how little the British know. We don't know about Ireland, do we? I mean, what, what the British did to Ireland, like zero. So, all right, here's a little test. How many people here have heard of the Mau Mau Rebellion? Put up a little a wave or I, something. I, of the Mau Mau Rebellion. Those who are good at emojis can do this. I, I'm hopeless. <laughs> there are a couple of hands have come up. Yes. That's two. That's two. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, from Neil. Okay, good. So that's a few people. <laughs> so for everybody else, the Mau Mau Rebellion was the resistance to the British rule in Kenya. And this oh, happened sweet. from the late... Ah, I'm from East Africa. Uh -huh. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> a little bit of a plus there. So basically what happened is that all the imperial pretensions of bringing civilization and the railways and, and cricket and all the other things, which the British now try and tell in retrospect about the Indian imperial adventure and sort of 19th century imperialism, they had entirely given up on by the 20th century. And that's when they kind of got to Africa. I mean, they never did that in, in, in Ireland at all. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't remember them ever saying they were bringing much to Ireland apart from guns and a big boat for all the potatoes. But um, basically they uh, used the African settlements in East Africa as a way to get rid of the troublesome, useless uh, scions of the upper class that weren't already ruling the empire and other places. So they, there was a whole bunch of settlers, particularly in, in Kenya, who went out there with bone china and gramophones and fascism and basically enslaved the entire Kikuyu tribe of about Happy Valley, says Zoe, precisely so. They moved to Happy Valley, which is uh, in the Central Highlands in, uh, in Central Kenya. And basically over time interned and tortured the entire Kikuyu population, which is a million and a half people. This only came out um, about seven or eight years ago in detail because of one woman, a Harvard academic, I'm sure it was quite well known about in East Africa, but it only came into sort of Western people's knowledge. Um, a, a Harvard academic who initially was doing a PhD on what the British did well in Kenya because she read all the, um, the files that were left over in the public record office and whatever. And they were all talking about civilizing missions and setting up schools and stuff. 
And then she went to Kenya and interviewed these Kikuyu people. And they were like, are you mental? They killed us all. And it turned out they burned all the files that were about the internment. And when she did research, she found that they'd, yeah, they'd killed tens of thousands of people and interned millions of people. And that is something that ended in 1963. So that is more recently than Spurs have won the league. That is, since the Beatles were formed, we had an empire that was busy torturing black people. And that is the era during which the Brexiteer cohort, all the old people who voted Tory in the last election, grew up. So their moral values are shaped almost entirely by this residual sense of empire, by this residual sense of British, Britain's greatness. And that sense of where has that gone and we should still have it, that is so prevalent in Brexit and in modern Britain. So again, you're sort of sitting there thinking, that's some interesting shit, how am I gonna write about that? We're, we're haunted by the empire, so let's do a horror story. So that's an interesting one. So another thing I do that I don't really, um, people don't really ever notice because all my reviews just say, make this Marxist go away. They never really engage with the place. Um, but what, one thing I do all the time is I completely change form. And quite, I just try and find the right form. I'm not, not in the, the way that Carol Churchill does because I'm not nearly as good as she is, but I try and do something different in a different approach or a different style. And so this one is a horror story because you, know, you want to talk about being haunted by the empire. So the malign spirit of empire, it's about an, a, a family that's had sort of posh family that has a house in the country and they've been in the empire for generations, you know, as administrators in India or uh, yeah, in the Raj or in different parts. And the grandfather was chief of security in the, in the Mau Mau suppression and his malign spirit does not want him to leave the house. And I'm not good at horror, man. Horror scares the living shit out of me. I'm like, I'm not scared of many things, but horror movies, I don't like them. So I'm kind of struggling <laughs> with the form, but sometimes if the form uh, feels like it's the right way to tell the story, you have to adapt yourself. And I find that, I find it great to challenge myself. I don't ever see the point, like good mates of mine who I respect as writers, but they write the same play over and over and over again. And I'm like, aren't you actually bored? Like, do you not want to learn something for yourself? If you're not learning and stretching yourself, if it doesn't come to a point in every play where you go, I've kind of fucked this one. I've bitten off more than I can chew. I shouldn't have done it this way. <laughs> then, then you're probably not doing it right. Uh, at least for me, I love that thing of uh, pushing yourself out there and trying. So like you said, I've written plays, two plays about China. I have a bit of an advisor that you know, I speak Chinese as my PhD. Um, one really long one, I think is a really, really good play that got slightly lost in the shuffle, which is in a certain a Maoist village from 1949 till the present day. Um, play about Zimbabwe, I've written a play about Israel-Palestine is one I'm working on at the moment. Um, Lampedusa, Lampedusa uh, migrants, yeah. yeah. Uh, migrants and, um, and, and Sicilians. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't understand people that find Britain that compelling that you just want to write out Britain all the time. Like, obviously there's a lot of important stuff, but don't you want to try other things that are part of, and there's a weird thing now going on where um, they, they're leaning on you quite hard not to culturally appropriate, which is an important thing to do because, you know, when David Hare writes about non-white people, it's cringeworthily embarrassing. But then when David Hare writes, it's cringeworthily embarrassing. The basic essence of a writer is to cross boundaries. So never, ever, ever let anyone tell you you shouldn't write about subject X or subject Y. What you need to do is understand it from the inside and not just make it a kind of extension of Western liberal values because other societies don't work that way. But you should absolutely try and cross boundaries and it's more interesting and challenging that way. I think, again, it's probably not gonna get you um, fame and fortune, but then there's a lot of other ways to get, uh, there probably are other ways to get fame and fortune, I wouldn't know. Okay, I think, um, first of all, I'm mindful of the time and I do want to open it up to others, but I just want to ask you a very important question. Mm -hmm. I imagine that um, anybody here who isn't familiar with your work now is saying, I, I desperately want to see an Andres Lewis Garden play. So what, what, what can we see now or in the near future when we can all be normal and social again? I don't know, man. I mean, <laughs> uh, let's hope. <laughs> There's a few in lots of different places. So, so this play I've written um, about Israel, Palestine is probably the best play I've ever written, I would say. It's, um, that's a tough subject to write about because obviously it's been weaponized to death in the last several years. Um, but also just everyone has an opinion on it. 
absolutely everyone has an opinion on it. And they have an opinion on it in a really abstract way that is largely completely uninformed by the nuances of what's going on. Um, so that is set on a vineyard in the occupied territories. And it's about a woman who is a, uh, who creates, um, buys the land in the 90s when it was quite, my family's Jewish, so I've spent quite a bit of time in Israel. Um, it was quite legitimate if you didn't think too hard to buy land in the 90s without being a crazy settler, like ideologue, like the people that go there now. So quite a lot of secular people still live on the West Bank um, and has created in on her own terms, this wonderful place. She's made the desert bloom. She's created this international vineyard that employs Palestinians. And, you know, she thinks she's one of the good people and she wants to give it to her son. And her son is an artist who's moved to London. And he's like, no, nah, man, it's covered in blood. I'm not taking it. So she basically says, right, if you don't take it, I'm selling it to this bunch of American lunatic settlers who will build a huge temple on it. Um, and it really belongs in you know, deepest terms to the Palestinian foreman whose father used to be the owner, but was displaced. And it's a way of getting all these different stories in. It's kind of like the cherry orchard with IEDs. It's kind of a way of getting multiple stories because everyone can empathize with relating to the land. And so there's not too much political chat, it's much more chat about vines and, and belonging, really, because we all kind of need that sense of belonging. So that is, that's a really fucking good play, man. Um, I got to tell you, which, you know, some of my plays are not that good, but that one's good. So, and where will it be? And where can we see it? <laughs> we will see, like everyone there wants okay. to do it, but um, <laughs> I have a feeling they'll bottle it, I really do. Um, I just don't know if they'll have the political courage because even though it is like scrupulously balanced in a way that, um, frankly, some of the some of the people <laughs> having that chat don't deserve, um, that subject has been weaponized to death. So very specifically, what I've had to do with that is take that burnt territory and bring it back into a subject where you can that you can discuss in terms of human relationships and real people rather than abstractions of Israel is this and whatever blah 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 blah, which are totally useless to everyone. Um, so that one might be on, hopefully. Um, we'll get a final call on that one fairly soon. I'm writing something for uh, Chichester, which is going quite well. And um, yeah, a few other things, man. We'll, uh, we'll have to see how they all shake out. But I was okay. to see which they were going to do before, a sequel to Lampedusa, actually, uh, which they were going to do before the lockdown. And then we'll have to see if how much of that stuff they bring back, you know. So there's things, there's things floating around, but... Um, what can you do, man? Right now, you just have to let it let it be, I suppose. Okay, okay. I'm, I am going to open it up now to the floor. We'll invite questions. So if you could just um, write your name or put up your hand or somehow make a signal there um, if you've got a question for Anders. And if uh, you do want to come in and talk, if you can turn on your camera as well. So any questions, please, from the audience. Zoe, hi. Zoe, do you want to turn on your camera? Hello. Hello. Hey. I <laughs> um, just want to say thank you and also that your new national play sounds brilliant. Like Cherry Orchard, but Israel Palestine. My God, I hope would love to see it. Um, okay. Yeah, I was just interested in what you said earlier about writers crossing boundaries and feeling confident about doing that. I've noticed that when I want to write about cultures or um, characters who have mm. races that aren't my own, as like a white, like, yeah, girl, it feels difficult sometimes to know how to navigate that space. Um, mm. And I just wondered if you could comment on that, because I imagine that you might have been, that, that might have been some, a critique that you've had before. And mm. if your academic background, perhaps, like as someone that doesn't have a PhD in political thought, like how to have the confidence to write about those themes and those subjects and feel, like I like like my position is valid. I just yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, you are you you know like me. We're in a culture where they're they're really pressing us very hard not to do that kind of thing, um, and it's it's sort of ludicrous. It's uh, I don't so there's this as far as I can see. There's a, a really strong movement on by white gatekeepers to essentially not give up any of their gatekeeping power by assigning an area where a little area for lots of different writers to write in. And certainly I've been, you know, I've been mates with Roy Williams and lots of other writers for a long time. And their biggest frustration is they are often told to write, to stay in the black box. You know, you are, it's fi you're fine to write black stuff, but 
you try and step out of that, they often get told, oh, you've, you've lost your voice. Where's your authenticity? And it's sort of, I think it's actually really quite demeaning. Um, but from the flip side of it, for white people is, um, I don't think having a PhD is, is any use to you. In fact, it's mostly unhelpful, I would say. I wouldn't worry about having that. There's not too many, um, uh, yeah, no, I I'm not even gonna get into slagging off academics, but I wouldn't say that's entirely beneficial. No, I mean, all you can do really is to think that anything outside of you is by definition empathetic. Anything outside of your own experience is by definition an act of imagination, right? It requires you to inhabit the shoes of somebody that you aren't. And that is what good writing is. It's inhabiting people that you may have entirely created from whole cloth, or you may have met them and you know, represented them very accurately, but it doesn't make any difference. You're simply, your job as a writer is to get under the skin of another human being. And you do that with another culture in the same way that you would do that with somebody that you know from a very familiar background, which is you try to take them as seriously as you take yourself. And I think that's where um, a lot of bad David Hare-esque representations of other cultures come in because cultural appropriation is 100% a thing. I mean, it's not to say that that is not a, a legitimate concern. There have been, you know, loads and loads of terrible plays about non-white non societies by white writers. And it's usually because, frankly, deep down, and this is a massive weakness in liberalism, they don't think the other cultures are quite as big and important and real and true as they are. And they don't really get deep down. And it's when you get, when you, you have to find out the specifics of how other places think and work and act differently, but it's just taking people as seriously as you would take yourself. What I, I mentioned earlier, the idea of writing characters you don't agree with, there's a good line from James Baldwin, who actually isn't a great playwright, although he's the absolutely finest pro stylist of the 20th century, uh, who said that you should, he, you'd always put his strongest argument in the mouth of his weakest character, because it stops you kind of necessarily um, getting on your soapbox and, and lecturing them. But it's, it's that thing about just taking other cultures and other people and other situations profoundly seriously in the same way that you would take people you know or opinions you agree with. And so, yeah, writing people who are quite right wing, I'm, I write loads of those characters. Nobody ever mentions that because they, they always, people would like to assume that my writing is left wing demagoguery and soapbox. Um, because they don't want to hear what I have to say. But actually, all my best plays, and there are a couple of plays where I've done that. There are bits in my play for the Royal Court where I've done that, and it doesn't work as well. Um, but all my best plays, are, so Lampedusa, is one in which you have two people who basically deal with migrants and deal with poor people and don't like them and can't afford to like them because it, it couldn't do their job otherwise. And eventually that facade cracks, and it's what happens to them emotionally after that. Um, the, the racist is kind of like that to a certain extent. You know, it's about somebody who... Um, yeah, his emotional, his sense of solidarity and class consciousness has been violated by, frankly, the betrayal of the Labour Party. And he has to find a way to, he finds somebody who he can't stand saying the things he wants to hear. Um, so yeah, coming at it from the, that's, to me, that, that, that's the same principle of inhabiting somebody that you don't know. Um, just in the most serious and profound way you can. And there's, there's no other, there's no shortcut to that. There's no trick to that. It's just digging deep and, and being quite compassionate with it, quite empathetic with it, which doesn't obviously require you to love them or not judge them at the same time. You know? But it's a good question because that- Thank that, you. That was, that was really great, thanks. We're in a very repressive time, Zoe, to be honest. We're in a, a time of profound liberal repression most obviously embodied by Keir Starmer, but very clearly in the cowardice of left-wing gatekeepers in the arts, and or not left-wing gatekeepers, sorry, liberal gatekeepers in the, in the arts, um, who are really very, very scared about being called stuff on Twitter. And, you know, I don't have a lot of fucking qualities in certain respects, but I am completely fearless. I don't give a fuck what anybody says about me as a writer because I'm really good and I don't care Ultimately, it's nice when people say nice things, but if they don't, they don't. I just stopped talking because I see there's two people who want yes, to ask. Yes, exactly. I was about to jump in and say, no, I, I think um, Nick, first yeah, Nick, of all, Nick was first in the queue. Nick Miles, are you there? 
Yeah. Hello, Nick. Do you want to turn on your camera? Well, I would love to. I, I just put some clothes on just so I can do that. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> hello. There I am. Um, hello, Anna. Uh, hi, Sue. Um, you've, you've spoken about how the critics uh, refuse to engage with the subjects you write about. And you sort of touched on also uh British theatre audiences which I sort of take to um mean that you're talking about this sort of like um um the what's it called when everyone shares the same view the something box group think or thinking inside the box or something I'm... um echo, like chamber. Echo, chamber. Echo, chamber. echo chamber there we go thank you that, that's the one so um my question really is in what way do you quantify um the effect that your work has had um, and you can sort of because I don't think there's a way of quantifying it to anything written if you like like I know I don't really you know reviews are what they are man I don't yeah that doesn't bother me a lot of writer mates of mine read Twitter and they think you can get the truth of Twitter but you can't really because a lot of that is people's mates and whatever it's just it's the feeling in the room um, and so for example we did that at the racists that is about uh, a bunch of uh, P and D uh, painters and decorators in Barking, and I presume I can tell the story now because it's quite funny. So we had a hotline to the police in case the BMP who it was about turned up, and I was like, "Man, the BMP don't travel. They're not coming. They're not cultural aficionados. We weren't running a right wing culture war at that point. Now they would. Dominic Cummings would probably be in the audience, which would be quite fun." Can kill him on the way out. Anyway, um, so basically we were sort of sitting around waiting for this thing. And then somebody came down and went, the BMP are here, the BMP are here. And I went up to see what was going on. And it was a load of stocky dudes in leather jackets, shaven heads. And I was like, man, unless the BMP have read my play and diversified, it's not the BMP because there's three black guys. So I went up to them and I was like, yeah, all right, what's going on, man? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're painters and decorators from Barking. We've heard there's a play about the P&D, so we've come to see it. And I was like, how have you even heard that this play in this little gaff in far west London is on? I've no idea, but that, and they loved it. And they just, and they, the guy comes up to me and then he goes, you've done any P&D yourself. <laughs> I was like, you see how that's a review. Okay, somebody who thinks that the painting and decorating techniques are accurate, I'll take it. But that has happened in a, very, a way I don't fully understand with almost all my plays. It seems to attract an audience of the kind of people I'm writing about and for in a way that is really pleasing. And I don't know how that works because I don't, it's not normally the theater is doing outreach, just the word gets out somehow. But even on occasions when it doesn't, um, so for example, I did a play, probably my second best play is after this Israel one, uh, it's called The Seven Acts of Mercy. And that is a play uh, that I did at the RSC about three or four years ago. And it's um, half, it's Caravaggio, painting, the first painting he did after he killed somebody. And it's him in this sort of unfinished church in Naples and his relationship with this life model. And the modern half is set in Bootle. And it's about a dying ex-docker who's trying to teach his grandson about life through this book of Caravaggio paintings before he dies. And it's a very emotionally powerful play, that one. And that one we largely had, as you would expect at the RSC, proper shire brexiteers do you know what i mean like serious serious died in the wall tories and i was like they've come for the caravaggio they're not going to want the critique of austerity and i was we, we, i was expecting a lot of walkouts and they all stayed and you could hear them talking afterwards on the, the whatever the thing is called the relay or whatever and you could hear them listening and thinking and going and saying things like that's a side of life i'd never really considered and that was a massive win because you're basically getting to people who are you know, they're not evil people, but they just read the Daily Telegraph. And so their perspective on the universe is deeply flawed. And if you can use that platform to bring a little bit of knowledge and expand their remit, that's what it's all about. The feeling in the room is about the only thing I care about. Um, and everything else, the writing and all that, you know, the, the, you know, how it's reviewed and all that, you can't, you can't pay any attention to that. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. No worries. Well, thanks for your question, Nick. Um, I think Arvin, you had a question. Is that right? Um, Hi. On your... Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Anders. Yeah, thanks so, uh, thanks so much for that. It's fascinating. I have a feeling you may have already answered my question um, 
and I do know the answer from what you said deep down inside me. Okay. Uh, but I'll throw it at you anyway, which is I'm a bit of a lazy writer because I've got to the point where, you know, I say for six months writing something and no one's interested. Um, and now I sort of just write things that I know people are going to pay me to take to the next stage, uh, you know, radio or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But um, I find that a lot of that involves talking to uh, people like arts council types, writing those applications to the people that you refer to uh, quite politely as the liberal left gatekeepers. <laughs> and um, I'm finding actually I'm completely losing my way because I'm now speaking a language that isn't my own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, talking uh, frankly bollocks um, and forgetting to actually write what matters to me. And uh, I don't know, what, what's the way out of that apart from biting the bullet and spending like six months in, in my garret writing? Is, is, there, is that the only solution? I would love to say there was a way of triangulating between essentially Blairite arts administrators and art. Mm. But there was, the only way to do it is literally or figuratively to kill the Blairite arts administrators because yeah, okay. <laughs> they have no in your work. They have no interest in work in your work with integrity. They really don't. Their only interest is in meeting particular box criteria of which some you will fit and some you won't. And you cannot possibly it's it's a, it's it's a perennial paradox for the artist is how do you create art and eat? And those yeah. two things are really, really hard to reconcile. For me, the only answer is absolutely to write the art that you care about and believe in and see where that leads to. I, I genuinely don't think there's any other way of doing it. Uh, obviously, you have to you know, play the game to a certain extent or try and talk to people. But as far as I can see, the minute you start letting, whether it's reviewers or what's trendy in the scene or the gatekeepers or the, you know, the money people, the minute you start getting them, you know, letting them get under your skin, which I think is partly inevitable, because you know you don't live in a vacuum or you know on the top of a mountain somewhere. Mm. But the minute you let that in, the minute you, you are not writing for yourself anymore. And if you are a writer with a purpose, and not everyone is a writer with a purpose, and I don't ever think people who don't have a purpose should write kind of political work. But if you are that kind of writer. It's the only thing that's important is, is the integrity of your writing. The only thing that's important is the integrity of your writing. Mm-hmm. And if you have to find another way to earn a living, so I'm actually a carpenter as well as a writer. And I'm quite, now quite good actually, uh, um, uh, put, making furniture and doing, I've done a, I just it was doing before it got knocked down, a course in site carpentry. So I was on, on building sites, putting up, partition walls and architraves and all that. And I love it, man, the this, this shit is great fun. I mean, it's mental and full of lunatics, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very, very interesting corollary to the abstract labor of the brain. You know, mm-hmm. you're working with the physical assembly of wood, things that cannot simply be um, jammed together there. So they, they, you know, wood has a certain grain and has a certain story inside it. And you're kind of trying to fin- finesse the story out, but that's, you know, and so, like Charles Dickens always said that the best kind of money job for a writer was a postman because you get up early, you walk around, you meet a load of people, you don't do any writing. So, you know, doing whether it's, you know, PR writing or arts admin applications, they're very antithetical to your, to your art. Just write mm-hmm. your art and, and bin the rest off is honestly the only mm-hmm. That's great. Thanks, Thank man. you. Cheers. Nice that question, Arvin. Um, I know Catherine. Um, if you want to come in with your question, um, we'll just try and keep it brief. We don't have much time left. Got you. Hey, Catherine. Yeah. Got you. Hi. Very refreshing about carpentry hey, and writing. That was brilliant. <laughs> uh, quick question then. Uh, given the fact that we could expect a pummeling from whether it's liberal arts gatekeepers, maybe not having any money anymore because of yeah, Brexit please. and COVID and all that. Um, a friend said to me, what are we going to do? Because there's going to be no money. And I said, we're just going to have to do it ourselves even if it means directing it, even if it means I'm going to go around with my hat and get money in and just going to do it that way. It's going to have to be maybe sod the institutions for a while. But how do you think about that? Are you, do you connect with producers and directors and try and keep things going? Or are you looking at you're going to do your own thing, like be your own theatre maker with your own money? And I don't have, like, I've, people are always like, why don't you direct your own work? Because um, you seem to be quite loud and shouty. And I'm like, yeah, but there's an incredible amount of, uh, little fiddly things that goes into directing that personally I don't necessarily have the patience for but 
I think a good person to ask that, honestly, is your man, Mr. Neil McPherson, because, you know, he's done a tremendous job of keeping that place going on no money and producing really good and, you know, unusual and radical work. Honestly, I'd rather see what the Fimber's banging out than the Royal Court is banging out these days. I absolutely would. Um, and I think there's more integrity to it, too. There's something in um, Neil's model I think we can learn something from, actually. I'm not just being out to kiss his ass. I would say that if, uh, if he wasn't here. That sort of... That, that when art, it's, it's sort of an extension of, of Avin's question. When art gets tied up with money, it really does compromise itself a lot. Um, so, yeah, I would be, you know... I, I, I think we, we are going to have to do a lot of it ourselves, actually. I really do. And, but in some ways, that's quite liberating. Like, mm, I, had a great mm. time the stuff. I really did, man. Um, because nobody's sort of leaning on you going, hmm, how are we, you know, how are we going to sell yeah, yeah. 500 tickets or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of, you know, going back to uh, the woman who set up uh, Stratford East, you know, Joan Littlewood and whatever, people, there was a lot of peripatetic work and things yeah. that people getting in the back of vans and whatever before it became much more institutionalized. This sort of idea that there was money, a fair amount of money for a fair amount of new writing is really quite a recent thing. It's actually one of uh, New Labour's better initiatives. New Labour on culture wasn't too bad. It was just mm. New Labour on absolutely everything else. That was <laughs> yeah. The amount of, yeah, th there's, there's been a sort of bubble of, of, of money for writing that we may not have anymore. And I don't know, I think it's just, for me, the art is the only thing that counts. The art is the only thing that counts. And I, I don't care. Like, I remember when I, we did Black Jesus, I'd just done my play at the um, uh, at the Royal Court. And my agent was like, don't do a play at the Fimbra after doing a play at the Royal Court, because it doesn't uh, suggest a career progression or whatever. I fired my agent. Um, it's sort of like, what's, you know, it's, it's, you just want to do the stuff and have it be meaningful. And I think we're just going to have to do it and have it be meaningful wherever. Um, and in some ways, if there's less, you know, you talk to the big head honchos at the big theatres, they do so much fundraising and so much ass kissing of dickheads. Like when they did the, my play at the court, they had to visit, they have a, a, a partnership with Coots, the Queen's Bank, also gigantic money launderers, um, which they had to temporarily suspend because it would have made my play look weird. But otherwise, they're spending all their time talking to money launderers. You know, it's like we have to eat, but I just feel like. I feel like in some ways, not to try and gloss out something that's a total mess, but in some ways, not having a, the, the, you know, the, the cherry at the end, you know, at the end of the stick or the lure or whatever, it might be beneficial. We, mm. just, have to, mm -hmm. we just have to get the work done. I'm thinking about making a micro film. I don't know anything yeah. about making films, but I've got quite a cool idea on that, which I think I'll just do. I'll just yeah, do yeah. it. But like you can mm -hmm. do it. And then I don't know where it would go, man. I don't really know anything about <laughs> rest but you just bring that energy to it you know and there's i've always found the worst bit, bits of my writing have been when i've thought about career stuff whether it's um you know trying to earn enough money to eat or whether oh this might lead to this with this or whatever the minute i've done that it just there's something that goes out of the writing so yeah, yeah. it's good to ask, man unfortunately yeah. thanks that's great um anders thank you, you so Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chat a few more minutes if there's any more questions. Or... Okay, okay, I'll throw it out for one more. If anybody else wants to come in for a final question, um, we just have to wait to see if they pop up on screen. Not quite sure. If we're done, then that's no problem. You see, most people would have sort of been expecting it to end now. So yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Okay, but uh, I would. Oh, so Zoe wants to know oh. about research process. Yeah. Sorry. If that, yeah. If, no, go on, go for it. Just quickly, I mean, obviously so many of your plays do deal with very different situations, I imagine, to those that you've lived in yourself. And I just wonder, do you have a process? Are you kind of like a documentary theatre maker? Do you speak to loads of the people that have gone through those things? Just if you do have a process, it'd be thrilling to hear about it. It's, it, it differs by the play. Um, so, well, so when I wrote the two China ones, uh, once I, one of them I did go out to China for, actually. Uh, and went to a part of China called uh, Wenzhou, which is south of uh, Shanghai, which is basically the area that was sort of the epicenter of the revolution. And now they make loads of tat. It's like the glove and spoon center of China. So it's a, a weird transition from radicalism to like proper capitalism and all the rivers are chocolate brown with pollution. And it's weird. Um, but yeah, so basically I went there and I went into the mountains and hung out in this village where they didn't speak any Chinese, which was awkward. 
uh, and just sort of got to know some old Maoists and stuff. So you can do that. I went to Zimbabwe to do um, the Zimbabwean play. But, you know, it's interesting. Like, quite often when I write characters and situations that are set in another society, I'm always worried, obviously, about them going, you are a moron. This isn't how we talk. You completely don't understand our society. But you'd be amazed at how people, when they see that your intentions are good, I suppose, in the same way that, so when I used to teach in prison, I never had any problem with discipline man, because you'd have all these stocky murderers and large fellas come in um, and you'd just be like, oh, no, I was going to kick off. But because they really enjoyed me taking them seriously intellectually, like asking for their opinion on, like I do a current affairs class or a politics class or a creative writing class. And because I would kind of empower them by giving them respect and wanting to hear what they had to say, never had any trouble. And then we had one session where they made me have this stand-up comedian who was one of the least funny people I've ever met in my life come into the prison and do a stand-up comedy thing. And he was so, he, was, he just was sneering at the fellas and there was a massive tear up. There was just a huge tear up in the room. People can tell whether you respect them or not. And so quite often people will say, you've really got our, so the, um, the part of, uh, when we done, I did uh, Seven Acts of Mercy, which is set in Bootle. I went up to uh, Liverpool and Kirby and Bootle and all them areas and wandered around for a couple of days. But I'd written the play by that point. And then we had a truckload of scousers come down to the RSC, which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Man all these scousers wandering around chatting to all these old schoolers. And they just kept coming up to me. How have you got us humor? You've got our fucking humor down. How have you got that, that brutal sense of humor? And I'm like, what do you mean brutal sense of humor? It's not that different from, no, 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 no. You've got us down. That is exactly how we talk. That's exactly how it is. And I'm like, it's not really exactly how it is. It's just that you can see that I respect you and I care about you. And so even though there are probably bits that are not 100% accurate, they're gonna let that slide because they can see that I'm kind of doing it out of love, if you like. So again, it's that fundamentally that thing of empathy and taking them seriously. Um, and if you start from that, if the good intentions kind of shine through, I think that's half the battle, I really do, even before you get to factual realities or rhythms of speech or political contexts or whatever. Um, if your mindset is right, it really helps. Thank you so much. Have you ever wanted to make a documentary? No, yeah, I love documentaries. Maybe I should make a documentary. I don't know. I do find I love talking to people. I find that the bit I don't enjoy about writing is the isolation. I find the sitting on your ass not talking to people bit quite difficult. I enjoy, I love the not going to meetings and not having to sit on trains bit. That's great. And not having a, you know, a futile job in an office or something. But yeah, the isolation I find difficult. So when I get to go and do the the research trips or the chats or the you know meeting people afterwards i love that bit man because it's um yeah it's a social medium that's another thing it's a it's the most social medium every other medium is predetermined and established for you you know even the cinema which is nice to be in a room with those of other people um you know you don't add anything to the show but a, a play is a it's a, it's a creative it's, it's just, you know, an alchemy between all the people in the room at the time. It's the most social medium. So, um, so yeah, when people write weird, chilly, distant arch plays and whatever, I'm just like, I don't get it, man. I get it. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> um, thanks a million, Andres. This has been absolutely fascinating listening to you. And, you know, we, we just love your your drive, your passion, uh, your reach, your ambition. And thank you very much for being you. Um, I'm very glad, I think I hear uh, Neil turning on his microphone there and uh, we'd like him to come in and just have a few words as well. Yeah, he is the man himself. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, am I on? Am I, yes, I'm you, on. you I'm are. Um, so uh, also worth mentioning, Anders is one of only two people um, who sent us an unsolicited play and had it go straight on without any changes. Uh, that was the Insurgents, his first play. Uh, and also, of course, I know he won't do it, and he does the art, I do the money. Buy his book! <laughs> oh, Buy his okay. Book. Of good things. Um, so they're the races that we did, uh, the Insurgents, uh, which was his first play that we did, Back Jesus, that we did too. Uh, go get your copy. Uh, thank you, Anders. That was inspiring. Uh, I am not on commission. 
<laughs> thank you as always that's been really inspiring and just what i needed actually yeah, i agree with is. everything you said um i did think with the mau mau thing there's the the old phrase filth failed mm -hmm. in london try hong kong Mm -hmm. It'll be a title for a play sometime. I think, I think that has been done, actually. I'm sure somebody did that. Maybe April De Angelis or somebody. I yeah. thought I've seen that. Yeah, but uh, if uh, the film doesn't work out, you know where I am for the play. All right, man, I'm on yeah. it. <laughs> okay, I think there'll be a lot of people uh, reaching for that book, Anders. And uh, and thanks so much for joining us from Copenhagen as well. You know, it's, sort of, it's just befitting, really, you know, nice and international from you. Well, the only so, downside is that they pronounce my name anus here, which is a bad thing, man. But otherwise, right. <laughs> they all think I speak Danish, which is bad, because they come up to me with this. It, Danish is, they're lovely people, but it's the most painful accent. And they're like, come on, man. Enunciate. They don't, I'm trying to learn it, but they don't say any of the consonants, which is awkward in a language comprised entirely of consonants. Anyway, <laughs> okay, right, and um, we're just getting loads and loads of uh, messages here saying thank you, Anders, from basically everybody in, in the group. So it's really been fascinating, and, and it's lovely to meet you virtually, and hopefully, we'll get to meet you in person, you know, and get you down to the bar and yeah, get you drunk. <laughs> we can do things in, con in conjunction, it would be nice because I think we're all yeah. listening. We really are. Absolutely, nice. absolutely. Um, right, guys, we will be back in, um, oh, for some reason my, uh, sorry, uh, just give me a second, <laughs> sorry. Right. What are you done? You're still audible, you just turned on. Yeah, the uh, yeah it's just my, um, sorry, my battery is about to go. Um, okay, so I think if I can ask Carmen to pop in, um, Carmen, do you have the dates for... Um, hey, yeah, sorry. December. <laughs> sorry uh, about that. Oh, no, no worries. Um, yeah, so the next one is going to be... Let me just get the date up so I don't say the wrong number. It's the 15th of December, which is a Tuesday again. And uh, we're going to have producer Vicky Graham. So she's an independent uh, producer based in London. Um, and yeah, she'll be, she'll be our guest speaker. And I'll send an email just tomorrow morning uh, with the info on that. So it'd be lovely to see you uh, all there. And thank you so much, Anders. And, uh, and to everyone else for coming. Uh, just a reminder, this is being recorded and will go on YouTube. Um, so uh, um, do tell all your friends because they, they can watch it. And just on that note, I would ask uh, if we can all just turn on our cameras, say goodbye. But if you don't want to be on YouTube, you don't have to turn on your camera. OK, um, just so it's nice to see everybody, you know, and sort of wave and, and hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> thanks. Oh, hello. People, look, people, isn't that great? Um, <laughs> OK, and hopefully we'll all get to see each other um, in the flesh soon. OK, yeah. Anders. Thanks again, and um, I hope we see you in the flesh soon. Okay. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. <laughs>